Yes, this is a project where the official PI is Lars Hansen at the University of Chicago. Um, the team, however, is myself and Young Yang Kai. Stand up, Young Yang. So um, I'm a Hoover Fellow, a Senior Fellow at Hoover Institution. Young Yang's uh, title is Senior Research Scientist at University of Chicago. Now, what we're this is part of a as a multi, multi decade research objective of mine, mine is to bring computational methods um, of the kind that are used in science and physics uh, to economics. Uh, in economics, there's this general desire to just have stylized, simple little models to highlight some points. Uh, pencil and paper, and um, even worse, Excel, um, are the preferred um, tools of analysis. Now, what, what I've been trying to do is, um, is say, well, you know, there, are, there is this stuff called numerical analysis that can handle things uh, in a more, more complex things. And now the example that, um, for which we could get some NSF support was uh, problems related to climate change policy. And so the, the issue is, okay, CO2 is rising, uh, that's going to lead to temperature increases, and then that temperature increase is going to affect economic productivity. Um, uh, some places in Canada, the trees may grow um, more, hot, long, uh, hot, higher with the extra CO2, and maybe f wheat um, um, output is increased by warming. But generally, the feeling is that uh, um, as the temperature goes up, economic productivity goes down. Now, there are a ver the, the tool that's used um, often um, is the models called the integrated assessment models. And that's where you have a model of the economy and a model of the climate, and then you have these interactions. The economy sends CO2 in the atmosphere, the atmosphere uh, raises the temperature and affects productivity. However, these models, with very few exceptions, are deterministic. They assume that all the economic actors know perfectly what the future evolution of the climate will be, given the CO2 injections, and they also know perfectly all of the economic developments in the future, like uh, how economic productivity is going to grow, and they, there's no risk in these models. There's no uncertainty. There are no business cycles. There's also no tipping points in the sense of, well, at some random time, perhaps, some glaciers melt. That's not allowed in these things, because that would make it kind of complicated. So, and, um, and the reason is economists really don't want to use modern computational tools. However, the question here is clearly one of uncertainty. If there's anything that's uncertain, it's one, the economy in the next decade or certain the next decades, and two, exactly what the impact is of CO2 on temperature and the climate and on economic productivity. The, to say there's no uncertainty and think you've done something is, is just, uh, I think, irresponsible. But um, now the, the problem, however, is that particularly on the economic side, we don't know what are the best models to describe economic dynamics. Now, I know there's disagreement, by the way, on the, on the climate side also. There's a variety of different models, and I don't know the details, but they, they, um, they produce different um, results when they have the uh, same uh, RCP scenarios, generate different uh, paths for temperatures, etc. So apparently there's some significant differences in these models. Now, that doesn't stop the climate scientists from doing science. They look at these models and compare them and try to learn from the different implications. In economics, the attitude is we don't know what the right model is, therefore we're not going to look at any of them unless they, um, unless they conform to my opinion of what I wanted them to say. Um, so we have enormous model uncertainty as well as even within a model parameter uncertainty. So um, what, we're get, now, what we're going to do is uh, basically take on um, one of these models that's common in the IEM literature, in fact the basis for the um, interagency uh, report of the U.S. government about five years ago. And we're going to add various kinds of uncertainty to it, and we're going to do parameter um, examinations. We're going to do uncertainty quantification, 
And so we're going to be doing what um, scientists and engineers are doing. And basically the main message is that this can be done. Um, now, those of you who know the climate literature will be familiar with um, the model by Nordhaus from about 20 years ago called DICE, Dynamic Integrated Model of the Climate and the Economy. And I'll just go quickly through the elements for those. In this model, there are three uh, carbon masses that are modeled. One is the atmosphere, the other is the upper ocean, and then the lower ocean. So CO2 gets in the atmosphere and then diffuses across those three um, levels. Now, there are two temperatures in that model. One is the atmospheric temperature, and then one is the um, ocean temperature. Um, and so now the atmospheric temperature is, of course, the one that affects economic productivity. Um, now then, there's a, a, the dynamics are that there's carbon emissions. Emissions come out of the economy, and they're roughly proportional to output, but then you can reduce emissions. But this is a control parameter. By increasing mu, that's called mitigation, you can reduce the amount of emissions. And uh, then, of course, there's some emissions from the land, net, maybe net negative, who knows, but anyway, that's another term. Now, the key thing is radiative forcing. This is the forcing term for movement in temperature, and it's related to the ratio of um, the amount of temp uh, the current temp yeah the, no the carbon in the atmosphere today versus pre-industrial times, and it's sort of that um, overall increase, and then this is the radiative forcing. Now, so that's a five-dimensional di uh, differential equation. Um, on the economic side, output is a function of the capital stock that we have, the population that work, and then also what's unique here is we're going to add in a random shock that sometimes, now growing up on a farm that's natural to think about because sometimes there's not much rain and so there's not going to be much corn and so uh, you can't feed out as many animals. Okay, some years you have lots of rain so um, things are good. So. Um, and that's, what, that's the dominant way in economics of modeling uh, business cycles, is that, is that some years things go screwy and get messed up, like 2009. Um, some years things were lucky. So anyway, that's a primitive, I'll agree, but that's a way. And then, uh, so then that's kicking things around. And otherwise we have a trend productivity and then an output, produ um, output function of capital and labor. So, that's the new thing we add here. And then uh, what happens is that the damp this is gross output, but then gross output is hit with a damage factor. And so as temperatures go up, this term goes up, but then it's to the minus one power. So um, the post damage output really is, here's the amount of out the um, output is, um, here's gross output, and then you have some damages um, that brings it down, and then some fraction of output is used to mitigate carbon. So that's, anyway, that's just the story, and that's the math. Um, now, this problem, okay, the way that this is uh, studied, um, typically, is that you ask, okay, what's the socially optimal decision regarding emissions? That's the problem that Nordhaus first did, and that's um, what <coughs> is typically done. Now that, given a deterministic model, that's just a simple model in uh, uh, dyna optimal control. Um, and it's deterministic, and it's actually, you can easily solve it on um, using a, uh, any of the solvers that's available under GAMS or Ample, and, and uh, that's been doable for decades. Um, but now what we're doing is we're adding in these uncertainties about the business cycle. You, you can't do, a, it doesn't boil down to optimal control, it's stochastic optimal control. And so then you have to take a, uh, an approach that um, uh, we call, dy call dynamic programming. And so there's a function we call a value function. This, by the way, is just discrete time version of Hamilton, Jacoby, Bellman, for those of you who know HJBs. So basically this value function solves this optimization problem utility today from your consumption, and um, of course it's scaled by the number of people, and then some valuation of the future, and the Bellman recursive principle says that this value function, if you know tomorrow's value function, you can get today's value function by doing, some opt by doing a constrained optimization problem. 
So it's a constrained optimization problem. Tomorrow's capital stock is gross savings. And then you have the climate system. So basically, you have a pair of differential equations describing the climate and then also one describing the economy. And then here's some random variables that kick the economy around. This is just an example of what typical in economics that the economic system can be represented by some kind of function and then you solve it by, by iterating it as a function in some Bonnock space. Then you have an operator that takes the time t plus one function and gives you the time t function. You start with some terminal time and then you go backwards. Um, this is also just like Hamilton, Jacoby, Bellman. The thing is that, in the, that people aren't particles. Their actions today don't just depend on the condition today, they depend on what they think is going to happen tomorrow. So that's why the solution, it, it, it's not an initial value problem like in physics. It's more of a re reverse time because um, people's actions today depend on what they ex expect in the, in the future. Now, there is a big numerical challenge, and that is these functions are multidimensional. You have to approximate multidimensional functions and um, efficiently, and that's where things get get um, bad. If you just take normal kind of approximation methods, sensor products, et cetera, complete polynomials, Christian dimensionality or just, um, just grows. So we, we created a, um, an anisotropic approximation method where basically you have high order polynomials in the directions where you have high curvature, but then um, where in the dimensions where there's lower curvature, you use less. And that results in significant speed up in our ability to solve this problem. And so this is naturally parallelizable with, there is a, okay, there's pieces of it that are naturally parallelizable, but then there's a, um, a, a parallel block is after you've done the value function for time t plus one, then time t, you have to do all of that. And those little individual optimization problems can be done independently, but then you got to bring them together and you have some parallel block. Now, on blue waters, parallelization is, I mean, we, we need it. The problem I'm going to show you today is a bit on the small side. We only... At each time period, we solve the optimization problem at 16 million points. Uh, the total number of op little optimization problems is 5 billion. This is a small problem. There's another one where we added in stochastic tipping points. There we had over a billion points, 372 billion optimization problems, um, 84,000 cores, 77 core years of time, linear scaling. So this stuff can make use of, of the parallel resources. Now, what are the results? One thing we did is we decided to look at you. Know, if we did nothing, what would happen? If, given, if you let the economy produce the CO2 it wants to produce, what would happen? That's called the BAU, business as usual projections. Now, climate scientists have, or the IPCC has said, well, these are the scenarios for emissions that we should look at. These are the scenarios. This one is a very optimistic one where basically we have extremely aggressive mitigation policies and also um, advances in technology. This one is a pessimistic one. Um, they have some story. This one, like, people aren't doing much or it takes time for them to do anything. So that's the range of scenarios for the economic side that then the climate scientists use. They run this into their climate models to then predict what the climate is going to be in reaction. But we show this gray region. Remember, this is a stochastic process. This is like random walk, diffusion process. The gray region covers the 1% to 99% quantiles of 10,000 simulations. So their worst case, their worst one, this green line, that almost gets to 30, is actually only about, um, and about 80, Anyway, it's only, this is one standard deviation above the mean. Here's the mean um, emissions in 2100. Here's the one standard deviation away from the mean. The IPCC scenarios miss the tail of about the top 20% of possibilities from this one economic model. So they're missing the tail um, that we care about. <laughs> because who cares if you're optimistic and there is no problem? It's the, what is the economy going to do? Well, it's possibly, with high percentage, going to do something far worse than what the scenarios say. And the thing is, this is for one parameterization, and, uh, and if I start doing parameterization sweeps, I'm going to get um, even a wider range of things. The IPCC scenarios are modest. I mean, Inhofe should 
shut up and not complain. Um, they're modest and optimistic. Um, okay, so there's a lot more things here. One thing we do is we do verification. We, every iteration, we do some checking to make sure that we solve that problem accurately. We do some Monte Carlo auto sample creation and then check the errors. And so we end up with uh, every step is um, like at least two digit accuracy or three digit accuracy for everything. So we check every step. Um, we do uncertainty quantification. And this is an example of the four dimensional uncertainty quantification over four parameters. We, we take a, a efficient set of points in 4D, solve the model for those points, run a Smolyak polynomial through it, and, and then we do this. this is, I think this is a nicer way of displaying results than tables with four different parameters. Um, so it, it shows against the range, of course, but then anyway. Um, so the, we're trying to follow the UQ literature. Now, we have had a couple of papers recently, one in Nature Climate Change and another one in uh, Proceedings of the National Academy. We have a variety of working papers on this. Um, oh, the Blue Waters, uh, they always say oh, you, in their reports, you've got to have some impact. Well, um, we discovered a while ago that the White, a White House report a, a year ago, uh, the title of the paper was that, and they incorporated our, some, uh, a paper, a conclusion in a paper of ours into, into the text of that report. So I don't know. Is that, is that in, in fact, that counts at Blue Waters? I don't know. Anyway. Um, and we're going to do many extensions, multiple sectors. This is just the beginning. This is highly parallelizable. And I want to end by, first of all, thanking Blue Waters for making this research possible. Um, and uh, the Blue Water support team has been very helpful um, over the past couple of years. I also want to make a special note of gratitude to Blue Waters. This work began as part of an NSF project that I'd worked on for years to create a multidisciplinary project that would incorporate climate change, climate science, and economics. Um, but after the, uh, about halfway through the grant, uh, the PI um, dumped me from the grant canceled support um, and uh, did that also to a couple other economists, basically killed off about uh, half of the computational economics work that was to be done and to, that would have created public domain tools. The PI killed that off, gave the National Science Foundation no reason. Um, this is typical of the hostility towards economics by non-economists. Economists are obnoxious and arrogant, no question. <laughs> Some say I'm a great example yeah, of that. Uh, yes, I have met some, um, but at least physicists will argue based on some math equations. Yeah. The, um, and but the thing, and, and economists don't, so the, and economists just don't want to go into the third millennium of computational tools. They prefer Excel and pocket calculators and fingers and toes. Um, so my dismissal from that project was an example of the two things: indifference on economics, hostility from non-economics. I. By the way, Young Yang is still on the project, but I stayed, it's still, the project is still consuming about half my time because I just believe that this is important work to do to show that not only in the climate change issue, but that in general in economics, that these tools, these computational tools um, that are used throughout science, and even by a French lit professor at Chicago, that these can also be used in economics. So there's a special note of gratitude to Blue Waters for me on that. Thank you. Yes? Could you flip back to your uh, publication list? Uh, okay, the published papers are those two. Yes. All right, you... Take a question, but you have to start taking your yeah. off. Okay. No, her, her, her PDF is on this machine. Okay. Yes? Uh, so what do you... PNAS and nature climate change. Now then there's, um, uh, there's some other ones. This is under review at Journal of Political Economy. Um, at lunch, if you want great stories, talk to me about that one.